mounted a large photograph of his great rival to keep himself focused on the task of beating this legendary figure. This personal rivalry remains one of the most compelling background elements of the Battle of El Alamein. But this most famous of engagements was not the first time that Monty and the Desert Fox pitted their skills against each other. When Montgomery took command of the 8th Army on the 13th of August 1942, he was concerned at the state of morale among some of his men, and he felt that the army lacked a firm leadership structure. The new commander immediately set about establishing his own unchallenged authority, and he was soon able to boost morale in the best way possible. Montgomery suspected that Rommel would make a final effort to break through the Allied line at El Alamein. But he had to consider how the Desert Fox would do this. Given the nature of the desert terrain, the British commander suspected that his rival would adopt tactics similar to those which had succeeded so well before the fall of Tobruk. Montgomery reckoned that Rommel would launch an armoured assault to the south of El Alamein before attempting to encircle the British defences, leaving the way clear for a march on Cairo. With this in mind, the British commander decided to lure his rival into a trap. He prepared a strong defensive position at the ridge of Alam Halfa, a deadly minefield protected by the men of the 13th Corps, a force that included two tank divisions. Montgomery knew that the ground was soft in this region. It was a poor area to carry out an armoured attack. So he decided to try and outwit Rommel, with a plan conceived by two of his most senior officers, his chief of staff, Francis de Guingon, and Brian Horrocks, newly appointed commander of the British 13th Corps in Egypt. The plan was to give the enemy false information about the terrain occupied by the 8th Army. Montgomery ordered that a staff car should be abandoned in the no-man's land between the two sides. Inside it was a fake map, giving the impression that the terrain was good to the south of the ridge. It was a juicy piece of bait, and the Germans took it. When Rommel launched his offensive on August the 30th, his movements were as Montgomery suspected. That day, the German commander ordered a diversionary infantry attack against 8th Army positions in the north, with the main combined force of Italian and German armour to the south. In total, 515 tanks advanced into the soft ground to the south of Alam Halfa Ridge. The British ruse had worked, and General Horrocks was able to talk of the egg having hatched. In the soft conditions, slow German progress was inevitable. The British minefield took a devastating toll as Horrocks's 13th Corps unleashed the power of 300 tanks several hundred anti-tank guns and some 64 batteries of artillery. The commander of the 21st Panzer Division was killed and Rommel soon faced the problem of fuel shortages. The supplies promised to him simply failed to arrive. The Desert Air Force threw up more problems. Not for the last time, the Hawker Hurricane made a substantial impact on the North African battlefield. By September the 3rd, it was clear that Rommel's offensive had failed and the German commander was forced to withdraw. Montgomery's trickery had contributed much to the outcome of the Alam Halfa battle. Less than a month after arriving in Africa, Montgomery had shown that Rommel was not invincible. Now the commander of the 8th Army turned his attention to a full-scale offensive of his own. He had good reason to do so. In the weeks that followed the Battle of Alam Halfa, substantial reinforcements of Allied men and material arrived in Africa as Montgomery considered the way ahead. Britain's allies in the United States increased their output of military resources as the American economy adapted to full war production. In early September, a total of 300 American Sherman tanks arrived in Egypt. New American weapons were also supplied to reinforce the British presence in the air, in the shape of four squadrons of B-25 Mitchell bombers. Egyptian ports became a hive of activity as new Allied material arrived in the region. By contrast, the Panzerarmee Africa was forced to rely on its existing resources.
Hitler promised Rommel substantial reinforcements of men and material. He assured his African commander that brand new Tiger tanks would soon arrive in the region. But the Fuhrer failed to deliver, and as summer turned to autumn, Montgomery knew it was time to take advantage of these German shortages. By October the 6th, 1942, Montgomery had finalised his plan for a general offensive. By October the 23rd, the British commander was ready to make his move. As ever, he exuded confidence. He felt sure that he had the right tactics, the right weapons and the right troops to secure victory in a second battle of El Alamein. For many people, the Battle of El Alamein was a simple fight between the African forces of Britain and Germany, Monte against the Desert Fox. But although the opposing commanders were a German and a Briton, the forces that they led were drawn from all over the world. Montgomery's army had an especially international flavour. This can be seen clearly on the map of the 8th Army dispositions prior to the Battle of El Alamein. In the north of the front line, the British commander deployed his 30th Corps, made up of the 9th Australian Division, the 51st Highlander Division, the New Zealand Division, the 1st South African Division, and the 4th Indian Division. To the south, Brian Horrocks's 13th Corps included brigade groups of Free French and Greeks, in addition to two British infantry divisions and an armoured division in reserve. But Montgomery's main tank force was positioned in the north, in the shape of 10th Corps, with its three armoured divisions equipped with some of the finest weapons of the day, including the American-built Shermans and Grants. These forces would have a key role to play in the early hours of the fighting at El Alamein. In all, Montgomery could call on the manpower of 195,000 men, a total that Rommel could only wish for. At first glance, the Axis dispositions at El Alamein were substantial. Rommel was able to call on 12 divisions, whereas Montgomery could muster only 10. But the divisions of the Panzerarme Africa were all short of their full complement of men, leaving Rommel with a total force of just 105,000. And 55,000 of these were Italians. The majority formed into five frontline infantry divisions, with the German 164th motorised completing the line nearest the coast. Rommel's command also included a small reserve force in the north and an all-important armoured presence. Two Italian tank divisions alongside two panzer divisions, the 15th in the north and the 21st in the south. These were the units who had advanced all the way from El Aguila to El Alamein in just six months earlier in 1942 and the panzers would also play a key role at El Alamein. But in terms of sheer quantity of armoured resources, the British enjoyed superiority of numbers. Montgomery could call on a thousand tanks, a quarter of them the powerful new Shermans. By contrast, the Panzerarme Africa possessed less than 500 machines, and less than half of these were of German design. 278 of Rommel's tanks were Italian built. Only 211 Type 3 and Type 4 Panzers were available to the German commander. And when fighting commenced, it soon became clear that the Allies had the weapons to deal with the Axis tanks. Of all the weapons deployed at El Alamein, this British single-seat fighter aircraft may be the most famous of all. Powered by a 1,460 horsepower Rolls-Royce engine, the Hawker Hurricane 2D was designed specifically as an anti-tank weapon. It was a modified version of the 300 mile an hour Hurricane that proved itself a